Good morning, everyone. Let me welcome you all to this time of worship and celebration of life here at uh, Westminster United Church. There are a number of announcements in your bulletin. Please read these over. Once again, I'd like to bring to your attention this flyer, Having Jesus for Dinner. It's being held on November the 2nd from 5 to 9 p.m. here at the church. Uh, our, it features Dr. Christopher Levan, who will be cooking a five-course meal for us. And uh, in between courses, he will be uh, talking to us and having a conversation about the significance of food and communion uh, in the Christian tradition and what does it mean in our tradition today. A number of you have said you plan to come. Uh, we do have to get a head count to Chris so that he will know uh, exactly how much food to buy. Uh, would you please make an effort to fill out your registration forms as soon as you can so that we can pass on these numbers to Chris. And uh, we have some other people with announcements this morning. And Michael just stood up and mentioned he has one, so I'll call on Michael first. Gentlemen before ladies today. I think I mentioned this already, but I'm not sure. So, uh, the Windsor Classic Corral. I now have a poster. And it'll be in the heart room. And for the, for the Zoom people. Okay, so it's a, it's a Monday evening on uh, November 11th. It's called Move Him Into the Sun. And... Uh, it's at 7.30 at the Salvation Army South Windsor Citadel. Tickets are $25, $15 for students. I don't know about seniors, but I'll ask. Okay, thank you. Hey, good morning. Uh, if you were here last week, this is a rerun. Um, but there's some people who are here now that weren't here last week. So in the coffee hour, I'll be uh, here with my petition. It's about um, calling on the province to restore funding to... Um, the um, on-site injection uh, treatment uh, programs that have been canceled uh, by the provincial government. Lots of controversy in the paper and in the news you've been reading about wanting to change the whole drug treatment regime um, without much evidence of uh, successful interventions. Um, so if you're interested, please see me in coffee hour and you can sign the petition. And if you really would like to, I can give you copies of the petition, which you can circulate as well. Okay, thanks so much. And Jeannie has an announcement. Funscript is due today, so if you are going to order this month, please make sure I have your order before you leave. Um, I did announce a couple weeks ago about envelopes. We're getting ready to... Um, order new church envelopes for next week, next year. So if you do not have envelopes, if you have envelopes, you will just get them again. But if you do not have envelopes and would like them so that uh, we can give you a tax receipt for your givings, uh, please let me know. Donaldson Diners is meeting this Wednesday at Armando's at 1130. If you have not told Sandy that you're coming, please let her know today so she can make a reservation. This has been a very busy week around here. Our good stuff rummage sale yesterday and Friday night was a great success. I want to thank all those people who came on Wednesday to set it out. There was a lot of stuff. We were really filled up downstairs. And more importantly, too, who came to work both Friday and Saturday and then helped put things away. And this is really a win-win situation for everyone. Not only do we get to uh, keep a little bit of money, but we sent um, items to the Windsor Youth Center, the Downtown Mission, the Welcome Center for Women. Were there any others, Bonnie? Okay. And I want to thank Bonnie for uh, delivering all of those. And... Um, I'm sure that they were most appreciative of having all of those clothes and boots and shoes. So at the end of the day, there is still a little bit of money coming in, but my total is $1,486.20 that we made. So 
a lot of hard work and uh, I'm sure everybody is tired, but um, it, was, it was well worth it. And we don't take a lot of rests around here in the fall. The fall is a very busy season for us. Our next event is on November 9th. We're going to have our Christmas market again. If you remember, we tried that last year. We, we did it up in the hearth room. Um, it's not a full-blown bazaar, but it did go very well. We need baked goods, cookies, squares, loaves. Those all sell very well. We, in fact, one lady yesterday at the uh, rummage sale said, are you having that again? She said, I bought a couple of trays of cookies, and it was great. I just had them for the holiday season. I didn't have to do any baking. And then we do have Christmas crafts, so if you have anything that you can donate towards that, that would be great. So that's going to be on November 9th from 10 to 1. Today, throughout the world, we're celebrating World Food Sunday. Some, but not all of our liturgy will be devoted to that. I would remind everyone that we do have lineups of people coming in to see Jeannie on Tuesday afternoons looking for help to buy groceries. Uh, there's a spot on your envelope to mark Benevolent Fund. Uh, this money is needed quite desperately, so please, on this World Food Sunday, consider making an over and above, and I want to emphasize an over and above offering for World Food Sunday so that we can help the people right here in our neighborhood and even beyond. Let us ta now take a moment to reflect on Westminster's acknowledgement of territory. Westminster United Church sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. We respect the long-standing relationship with First Nations people in this place, in this 100-mile Windsor-Essex Peninsula and the Strait, Les Détroits of Detroit. This morning's entry into worship and celebration is a responsive one printed in your bulletin. I invite you now to please join with me. Do not take life for yourselves too seriously. Live now. In each moment, expect a miracle. Enjoy creation. Look around you and see the beauty and wonder of this day. In this gathering. Look around and see, look around you and see the joy, the possibilities of this day. To live and love. We refuse to die before we die and rather live life full. To the fullest as best we can. We celebrate the whole of life. Our words of awareness were written by Ian Lawton of C3 Exchange in Michigan. It's responsive. Our Christian tradition says God calls us to renew ourselves and our life's purposes. As we gather with others who are searching. This morning's reflections are found in chapter 53, verses 3 to 12 of the book of the prophet Isaiah. This is an Old Testament text, and it's often interpreted to be about Jesus, and you may recognize it sometimes from Good Friday and uh, even Easter readings. However, we should remember that this was written in the year 143 BC, and originally, the suffering servant referred not to Jesus, but to the nation Israel. Here then the words written by the prophet Isaiah. You were rejected and despised by all. You know suffering intimately and were acquainted with sickness. When we saw you, we turned our faces away. We despised you and did not value you. Yet you bore our illnesses and carried our suffering. We thought you were being punished, struck down by God and brought low. But it was for our offenses that you were pierced, 
for our sins that you were crushed. Upon you lies a chastening that brings us wholeness, and through your wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us goes our own way. But God has laid upon you the guilt of us all. Though treated harshly, you bore it humbly and never opened your mouth. Like a lamb being led to slaughter or a sheep before shears, you were silent and never opened your mouth. Seized by force and condemned, you were taken away. Who would ever have foreseen your destiny? You were taken from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. You were buried with evildoers and entombed with the rich, though you had done no wrong and deceit was not in your mouth. But God chose to crush you and afflict you. If you make yourself a reparation offering, you will see your descendants, you will prolong your days, and the will of God will prevail through you. Through your suffering, you will see contentment and light. By your knowledge, my righteous one, my servant, you will justify many by taking their guilt upon yourself. Therefore, I will grant you a reward among the great, and you will divide the spoils with the mighty. For you exposed yourself to death itself and allowed yourself to be counted among criminals while you bore the guilt of many and interceded for sinners. This morning's affirmation of faith was written by John Vandelaar, and it is a responsive one printed in this morning's bulletin. We dare to dream of a world in which hunger is unknown, where scarcity is an illusion. And everyone has a place at the table. We dare to dream of a world in which generosity is the norm, where greed finds no foothold. And there is more than enough for all. We dare to dream of a world in which love rules, where compassion is the first response. And there is no room for bigotry. We dare to dream. We dare to believe. We dare to pray for these dreams to come true. And we dare to pray for others and ourselves. Let us take a moment and reflect on this affirmation of faith. May a heart of peace rest with you. And also with you. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed or not, this year, according to the lectionary, is the year we look at the Gospel of Mark in some depth. And as we've made our way through that particular Gospel, even though Jesus has told the disciples and those who listen to him time after time after time, that the kingdom of God that he proclaims is in sharp contrast to the kingdoms and the empire that they know in their day and age. And somehow his disciples, even though Jesus had said this over and over and over again, they just don't seem to get it. According to the gospel writer Mark, this morning's reading tells us that the disciples just seemed incapable of imagining or dreaming of a different world incapable of reimagining or dreaming of a different social, economic, and religious world other than the one in which they were living at that time. And that probably explains why in this morning's reading, James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, took Jesus aside and they said to him, uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus says, yeah, what do you want? Well, when you finally come into your kingdom, when you're the new supreme ruler, when maybe even when you're the new emperor of Rome or the king of Israel, we want to be number one in your administration. We want to sit at your left hand and your right hand, and we want to exercise great power. And then the other ten disciples caught drift of what James and Peter had said, and they made it pretty clear to Jesus they thought James and John were just getting a little too big for their britches. Somehow it seems that 
at least in Mark's gospel, that all Jesus' disciples were convinced that when the kingdom of God that Jesus preached became a reality, they're all going to rise up. They're all going to get big promotions. They're all going to become cabinet ministers or better. They all were looking to the way things were at the time. They were seeking the same kind of status as the rich and the powerful religious and ruling class. The elites held over them and the vast majority of the Israelite population. You have to remember that the world in which Jesus and the disciples lived was very different from the world in which we live today. Very different mindset from what we're familiar with these days. It was a hierarchical world. The structures were all giving people power at the top. It was a world in which there were strict social boundaries. In other words, the world back then was a world in which everybody and everything had its place. And it was the ruling class and the religious establishment, often the same people who determined what went where and who stood where. In other words, the minority, minority at the top of the social pyramid decided the way things would be, and it was always to the advantage, their advantage, to the advantage of the rich and the famous. To state the obvious, it was a rigged system. A rigged system that favored the rich and the powerful and those who perceived themselves as super religious. Back then, people believed that was just fine. That was okay. After all, the religion taught them that the righteous shall prosper. And they further believed that people prospered because God favored them and God blessed them. And so the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. And the general feeling was, well, that's okay too. Why? Well, the poor are always going to be with us anyway. That's just God's way of doing things. But all this hierarchical attitude, this religious stuff, presented a very serious and very practical problem back in the time of Jesus. This system gave rise to systemic injustice, systemic injustice that made life intolerable for a mass of underclass of human beings. Life became intolerable for the great majority, not just a handful, but the great majority of people who, be, who were poor, marginalized, people who were dominated by the ruling and religious minority and elite. But here's the thing. Unlike his disciples, Jesus didn't see the domination system in which they were living as being inevitable. Unlike the majority of people of his own time, Jesus didn't see this as being blessed by God. For Jesus, there, would be, there was another way. There was a better way, a better way for the world to be organized. Jesus knew that even though the vast majority of people were being dehumanized, that deep within each and every human being, deep within their mind and their heart and their soul, that people really do recognize their common humanity. Regardless of the terrible circumstances in which they were forced to live by an elite minority, every person, Jesus believed, has the capacity and the desire to help another person. Or to come at this from a slightly different angle and to speak theologically, Jesus envisioned the world through the eyes and the heart of God. As the, late, as the late New Testament scholar Marcus Borg has pointed out, and later his widow Marion, for Jesus, God was pure compassion. Pure compassion. And for Jesus, 
His insight was that once his own followers were energized by God's compassion, they should strive to be as compassionate as God is compassionate. And again, as both Marcus and Mary Anborg have repeated over and over again, Jesus evoked compassion for everyone whom he encountered. We can follow his example even today because at our deepest levels, at our deepest human levels, we human beings, and evolutionary psychologists will tell you this, we human beings are hardwired to be compassionate. Remember when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God being within you? What was he saying? He's say, saying you have it in you. You have it in you to identify with other human beings. You have it within you to be sympathetic and empathetic. You have it within you to reach out and to help those who've been beaten down and who are suffering and are wearied by the constant struggles of everyday life. The kingdom is within you. You have it in you, says Jesus, to relieve the suffering of the world. You have it in you, if you so desire, to relieve the suffering of masses of people. God is compassion. Jesus lived a life of compassion, and he expects us as his followers to do the same. Yet in spite of everything the disciples had seen, everything they'd been through with Jesus, James and John just couldn't get it through their heads that there might be a world far different from the one they had internalized from conventional wisdom. You know, it's important for us to remember that conventional thinking and conventional wisdom is called that, called conventional wisdom, because its main purpose is to uphold the way things are, to maintain the status quo. It tells us you must not question the way things are. You must not challenge the way things are. Conventional wisdom and conventional thinking says you can't beat City Hall. Don't even try. And that's what conventional wisdom in the time of Jesus in our own time wants us to feel and to think. And conventional wisdom, Jesus knew, numbs people individually and collectively. It numbs us into an emotional, mental, psychological, and spiritual paralysis. Into a paralysis that won't let us dream. A paralysis that won't allow us to act on behalf of our vision or our dream, even when that vision comes from God, who is pure compassion. Again, that's probably why James and John saw themselves in recognized positions of power, in being number one, sitting to the left and right of Jesus' throne. Unlike Jesus, they seemed utterly incapable of dreaming or imagining or envisioning another kind of world or another kind of kingdom or empire. They saw the world through conventional wisdom, the conventional wisdom of their time. They thought if they played the old imperial game, even though they were newcomers, they were going to change things. But they could not unless they had a new vision, a new dream, the dream of Jesus, the dream of the kingdom of God. So what are you and I to make of this story in Mark's Gospel? I think it's three things. First, in this report in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45, we're reminded that when you and I choose to follow Jesus, we take on an enormous responsibility. We take on an enormous responsibility for ourselves, for others, and for the entire world. Second, this same story tells you and me 
that being a follower of Jesus means we take on a different kind of life. Perhaps even an alarming kind of life. Why alarming? Because we dare to abandon old habit, habitual living, and we reject conventional thinking and wisdom. Third, like Jesus, we as his followers and disciples offer the world a different story. We offer the world a different dream, a different vision, a different and more creative imagining of how life might be made better and how the world might be improved. Yes, we can choose to do these three things. We can change the world. We can make other people's lives better. But folks, not, let's not kid ourselves. Time's running out. The clock is ticking. Climate change tells us that. Disasters like deadly forest fires and the floods, deadly hurricanes and tornadoes like the one the Florida and the southeastern United States or have experienced and are still recovering from. These things warn us that the clock is ticking, that time is running out. And that isn't even to mention Vladimir Putin's threat to use nuclear warhead against Ukraine and the West. It's very late in the history of planet Earth. The good news is that it's not too late. So let's get at it. Let's become compassionate and reach out right now. Let us pray our prayers, prayers of commitment for this World Food Sunday. God, there is no shortage of ways we can help heal the world. We just need the willingness to see them and the courage to act. So we pray for your inspiration and strength to use the abilities and resources we have for the sake of those who need them. We pray for those of us who have plenty, plenty of wealth that can lift some out of poverty, plenty of power that can influence the world toward justice and equity, plenty of relationships that can connect those who can help each other. Plenty of creativity that can inspire and challenge through new ideas and new visions. Plenty of time that can be used to feed the hungry, transport the weary, and befriend the lonely. And we pray for all who need ordinary gifted people to ease their grief, their pain, their trauma, their needs, and their fear. God of Jesus and our God, do not let us rest until we have found a way to help the cause of compassion and humanity. And now let us take a few silent moments to continue praying for others, asking everything we dare to ask for ourselves. Please join me with me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we observe this World Food Sunday, I invite you to give your gifts and to make your offerings. With your heart and your mind and your eyes, turn towards lifting up the poor and the hungry in this city of Windsor, in this community of faith and well beyond.
Let us pray. God of mercy and compassion, the gifts we bring are so small in comparison to the vast needs of the world. Nowhere near enough to save the hundreds of thousands who are dying of starvation or malnutrition, or even to meet the needs of the hungry and homeless here in Windsor. Yet still we come, still we come with open hearts and hands, bringing whatever we can. As Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish, may these gifts be multiplied as well, so that once again, the hungry may receive all they need. In Jesus' name, amen. Wish to thank everyone who has taken part in the service today and the people working very hard behind the scenes, preparing bulletins and so on. Also, Michael and Joanna, thank you for that beautiful anthem um, about Martin Luther King, and I have a dream. A reminder that if you plan to come to the Professor Levan's dinner. Uh, the forms are on the back table here, and there are also some in the uh, hearth room. So please pick them up and fill them out, and we will pass them on. The time has come to leave this sacred place of worship. As we leave, may our loving and compassionate God take our hands, our lives, our stumbling generosity, and our simple actions, may God, and may God find them good enough to help prepare a banquet for all people. May the love of God embrace you, the way of Jesus challenge you, and the wisdom of the Spirit renew you.